right, I want to go ahead and give the lecture for Unit 3, um, uh, which covers Chapter 5 and 6 from the book. So Chapter 5 is about opioids, and you can follow along with the PowerPoints if you like. Um, of course, opioids in general uh, refer to opium and the four derivatives that come from that morphine, heroin, codeine, and thebane. Um, and even that we can uh, break down into more categories. Um, we can talk about the natural compounds that come from opium, morphine, codeine, uh, thebane. Uh, we can talk about derivative compounds uh, that come about through making specific chemical composition changes. Um, we can talk about derivative compounds created by uh, changes in morphine or by changes in codeine and thebane. Um, we can talk about um, compounds synthesized in the laboratory. So there's a chart in your book and in the PowerPoints that just show the connection. Um, so we've got opium at the top and it breaks down into morphine from which heroin is derived and uh, some of the other derivatives. Uh, codeine breaks down into hydrocodone. Uh, thebane breaks down into oxycodone or Percocet types of tablets and oxycontin. Um, and then we've got synthetic opioids at the bottom list and you'll see the list there, methadone, etc. Well, opium's been around for thousands of years. Um, of course, as you probably all know, it's uh, harvested from the opium poppy. Um, and beginning in the 17th century and continuing into the end of the 19th century, uh, there's been a liquid form called laudanum, and it was pretty popular as a medicinal product and recreational drug uh, in the United States for a while. Um, the book talks about the Opium War uh, from 1839 to 1860 uh, in China, fought by the British and later by the French and American soldiers and sailors um, because they wanted to force China to import opium to trade. Um, and so this just really opened it up to international trade, opened up China. Um, and so for quite a while in Britain and the United States, opium was a pretty mainstay uh, patented medicine. It was available to all ages and all levels of society. Uh, women in the U.S. were attracted to opium drinking. Men engaged in uh, recreational use of alcohol. Um, smoking was considered despised as immoral and ruinous, um, largely due to uh, that being associated with Chinese immigrants and the, uh, uh, you know, blatant racism of that piece, obviously. So the, the primary active ingredient at opium, which is morphine, was isolated in 1803. Um, and with the invention of the syringe in the mid-1800s, it made it possible to inject morphine directly. Um, and in 1898, it was modified into uh, something called heroin, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And it was first synthesized by the Bayer Company uh, in Germany. And heroin's more fat-soluble. And what that means is it uh, it's more rapidly absorbed into the brain than morphine is. Therefore, you get a much stronger initial uh, response. And once it's inside the brain, um, the effects themselves, though, are pretty identical to morphine. It's just the quickness of heroin um, that makes it different. Um, in the PowerPoints, we've got slide five, table 5.1 that talks about the symptoms both administering and withdrawing heroin. Uh, so I'll let you read through those, but some ob pretty obvious things, lowered body temperature, uh, administering, elevated body temperature, withdrawing, um, tendency for constipation, and administering diarrhea when withdrawing. So what you'll often find are um, what's called a rebound effect, um, that the things 
that the drug does um, creates a situation in the body where the body says, well, I don't, I don't need to do this as much because uh, the chemicals are here in the body, so uh, the cells tend to, uh, the receptors tend to die off, so you actually become much worse, of course, when you withdraw. So, as I mentioned, it was pretty common in American society, and the abuse potential of morphine, and especially of heroin, wasn't fully realized until just the beginning of the 20th century. Um, by 1900, um, there were about 250,000 opioid-dependent people in the United States, and there are some estimates that the actual number could have been closer to 750,000. They just weren't reported. After 1914, um, there were some legal acts. The Harrison Act in 1914 uh, made it illegal, so of course it drove it on heroin underground, um, and so it became associated with criminal uh, life and became a black market drug where you could only buy it on the street. In the 60s and 70s, um, heroin abuse became frequent with African American and other minority communities uh, after World War II. With the drug revolution and the military involvement in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, the issue of heroin abuse, abuse became much more widespread and um, and hit a much wider population, of course. Um, since the 1980s, um, black tar is considered, uh, it's a potent form of heroin originating from Mexico, and uh, fentanyl is a, a chemical derivative, derivative of thebane, um, which has all been used as a prescription painkiller. The street name for it is China White. Um, Heroin use fluctuates, but appears to be on the rise in the 80s um, because more restrictions were being placed on prescription painkillers, so people needed wanted something to deal with the pain and they weren't able to get the prescriptions. And um, certainly that's been happening more now, and I don't have to tell everybody listening about how bad the epidemic has gotten in Cincinnati and a lot of other areas. Uh, effects on the mind and the body. Um, heroin and the other opioids uh, induce a state of tranquility, a feeling, drowsiness. Um, I once had a client tell me that taking heroin is like being hugged by God. Um, there can also, of course, be an itching sensation. The eyes start to get more red. Um, pupils constrict. Um, there's a gastrointestinal slowing, which basically means constipation over time. Um, at high or unpredictable doses, heroin depresses breathing and can produce death. So when someone overdoses, uh, it's not the drug itself that's poisonous. What it does is it they become so relaxed that they stop breathing, and so obviously death uh, results because of the inability to breathe. So how does this work in the brain? Um, since the 70s, we've known um, about some of the brain areas that uh, uh, are affected here. And there are certain morphine-sensitive receptors in the brain. And the reason Narcan, a naloxone, um, is helpful is because it can basically block uh, these receptors to, to nullify the effect of the drug. Um, so basically we know that the brain produces a group of chemicals called uh, endorphins, opioid peptides, um, that are associated with these morphine sensitive receptors. Um, so endorphins are the natural uh, feelings that your brains do and these opium derived drugs stimulate that same sort of uh, effect. And so you can see uh, in the picture of what the molecule looks like, they're pretty similar, and so that's why naloxone or Narcan can block 
fill up the receptor so that the morphine and uh, heroin can't uh, get in there. Um, so as I said, these, these are collectively known as endorphins, these chemicals uh, that produce these effects in these brain receptors. Um, now, of course, uh, heroin abuse, huge problem. The uh, main way of doing it is mainlining or shooting uh, intravenous. It goes directly into the bloodstream, and it's a very quick effect because it'll pass straight through the blood-brain barrier that normally tries to block um, things in the bloodstream from the brain, but it goes right through there, so you get a very quick effect if it's injected. Um, and, of course, it can also be smoked or snorted or injected under the skin. Um, but typically it's not taken orally because the stomach will digest it and break it down and it won't be effective that way. You won't feel the effects. Um, yeah, there's, and of course, another big piece of uh, heroin abuse is that tolerance can build pretty quickly. So what happens is people need to take more and more and the withdrawal symptoms start to come four to six hours after the previous dose. Um, so what happens is a real need to take this every four to six hours. Um, and you can tell that the tolerance is building when it takes more and more, of course, of the drug to get the same effects. So what happens is, as I said, even though heroin per se is not deadly, what it does is you have to take more and more to feel the effect of it, and you end up taking so much that you literally um, cut off the respiratory. Uh, you just don't breathe anymore, and so the overdose, uh, is that's the product of the overdose. Um, some of the forms of synthetic heroin, too, um, sometimes have uh, impurity in them that has been known to cause symptoms like Parkinson's disease where you get uh, shakes and damages your nerves, basically. Uh, withdrawal symptoms, obviously an intense craving for the heroin after in that four to six hour period. Uh, lots of physical symptoms such as, such as diarrhea, dehydration. Um, and again, a huge problem is because heroin's illegal, um, when you get it, you never really know what you're getting. So even the same amount could be stronger than the last dose. It could be mixed in with fentanyl or other things. So you never quite know what you're doing. So what can happen is somebody accidentally takes too much because they don't know the strength of what they're taking. So treatment um, is gonna really need both short and long-term um, attention. In the short term, you really have to go through a detox period. Your body will literally be shaking, diarrhea. Um, so certain drugs will be able to uh, extend basically the half-life so that your body can come down a little more gradually um, so it's not so awful in the withdrawal uh, phase. So just detoxifying is the very first step. Uh, and, you know, reducing the craving and the, the physical dependence that the body had. More long-term, you may need to get into, um, obviously, treatment. One, one thing is methadone maintenance. So methadone um, is legal. It's not that expensive. Um, and you can take uh, an oral dose. And... So it's a way to get through what the heroin was doing, but a little bit safer, not as uh, uh, overwhelming. And there's a couple other options like uh, lamb um, that don't have to be taken as often. Another treatment now um, is uh, Suboxone. Um, there's also Subitex, but it's a synthetic opioid that also helps um, to uh, slow down the cravings, give you a different sense. And you know, I'm told that methadone, of course, and suboxone still produce something of an effect, um, but it's certainly not as overwhelming and it's not as deadly and not as dangerous as heroin. Now, one thing that you have to be careful of, of course, is that 
Uh, methadone can be injected, so somebody could take it and then inject it and get more of an effect with it. Or they can crush up some of the tablets, the Suboxone, um, and put that into a solution and try to uh, inject that. Um, some of them now are dissolvable films, so you just put them on their tongue and you see them. Um, those are harder to uh, mess with. Um, a lot of methadone clinics want you to drink the methadone right in front of them so you won't be taking it home and injecting it. Of course, there's uh, controversy about these types of programs. Some people say all we're doing is just prolonging uh, the addiction by giving them methadone and other things. Um, uh, it can certainly be very challenging. So any treatment program really needs to be multimodal, meaning including uh, you know, whatever else you do, you want to look at medical factors, obviously psychotherapy, 12-step uh, groups, you know, you want to, it's such a challenging addiction, you want to hit it with as many things as possible. Um, of course, there are also medical uses of the opioid drugs. Um, narcotics have been very helpful, uh, treating pain, um, dysentery or diarrhea, uh, it helps suppress coughs, um, but and, and there's dextro uh, methorphan, um, which uh, has also been prone to abuse. Where some people will literally just find that uh, and and be drinking that in the cough syrup, etc. So you'll notice some uh, to get some cough syrups now. You have to sign your name and show your ID and. Uh, they'll track how much you're buying. So uh, there's a chart, I won't go through the whole chart that you'll see in the book that uh, breaks down all the pieces and all the medical uses uh, of the opioids. Uh, of course, now you have to be very uh, careful when you ask for a prescription. Um, you know, doctors have to do due diligence to make sure um, Sadly, sometimes that means people who really need pain relievers don't get them if they have a history of abuse or there's some um, suspicion that they might just be trying to get them. Um, other times people don't intend to get addicted to them but end up getting addicted um, because of the effects that they really do have. They really do take the pain away and that becomes a, a negatively reinforced. You really want to do that to take away the pain. So again, side effects, even for the prescription pain medication, uh, can include depressing the respiratory system, uh, intestinal spasms, obviously you feel sort of sedated and out of it. Um, so there's been quite a concern about how often pain relievers become uh, diverted and sold into uh, drugs of abuse. Uh, three big ones that are prone to abu abuse are Oxycontin, Vicodin, and Percocet. Um, they're very powerful, and when you go through a surgery, you've got some serious pain. They're quite a blessing, but uh, they're obviously very prone to abuse. And people can get pretty clever about how they crush them or inject them or what they do with them in terms of making them even more powerful for abuse. Um, Vicodin and Percocet have a longer history of abuse as well. Um, they say in uh, 2009 when they did a study, they said about 15,000 deaths uh, were due to overdoses of cocaine or heroin. It'd be interesting to see if anybody wants to talk about that in the discussion section. I'll bet that number's gone way up in the last uh, eight years since that study was made. All right, so let's jump over to chapter six now. LSD and other hallucinogens. All right, so basically, of course, by definition, hallucinogens are drugs that produce distortions uh, of perception and of your sense of reality. So they've been called psychedelic, which literally means mind-expanding uh, drugs. Excuse me. In some cases, you know, people that use these will say they've been transported into a new reality. I, excuse me, had a client once who would take DMT 
and then talked to his deceased grandmother, said he was able to see her and converse with her uh, in this particular state. Certainly, traditionally, shamans would use this to transport to a different reality and interact with different forces of nature, etc. So some drugs can produce hallucinations at higher levels, uh, marijuana, for example, um, but hallucinogens, uh, strictly hallucinogens, can produce them even at low or moderate dose effects. So there's four basic groups of hallucinogens, and you'll see the chart there in your textbook. There's hallucinogens related to serotonin, uh, LSD, psilocybin, uh, morning glory seeds, DMT, uh, harmine. Um, there are hallucinogens that work on norepinephrine, uh, including mescaline, uh, ecstasy, uh, hallucinogens related to acetylcholine, uh, such as atropine, um, and uh, things derived from the datura plant. Uh, and then there's just sort of a miscellaneous category that includes PCP and ketamine and salvia. So in the first three, uh, the, they're so named as obviously because of the neurotransmitters they affect, the serotonin, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. The miscellaneous group just includes synthetic hallucinogens such as PCP and ketamine. Uh, so um, not necessarily based on a specific transmitter that they're working on. So LSD, um, one of the best known of the hallucinogens, uh, belongs to the serotonin group, uh, originally designed from ergot, um, which is a rye fungus that's actually toxic, uh, but a fungus, purple fungus that grows on rye. And in fact, it was responsible for thousands of deaths over the centuries from people accidentally eating this because it's toxic. In 1943, Albert Hoffman was able to synthesize it uh, into a more specific drug. And so uh, initially in the 1950s and 60s, the CIA was experimenting with this uh, to see if it might be useful, uh, maybe as a, something to give to people when they're questioning them to break up their sense of reality. Um, but Timothy Leary was an original researcher who uh, became famous for uh, telling everybody to tune in and drop out and turn on, etc. Um, and so really popularized it in the 1960s. And it was in 1966 uh, that it was first made illegal. So the experience of uh, tripping, <laughs> tripping on acid, is based is unpredictable. It's different for different people, uh, but there's certain common features. One tends to be colorful uh, hallucinations. Uh, syna synesthesia is where the senses mix with each other. So it's almost as if you can see sounds or hear sights. Um, there's sort of distortions of perceptual reality. Things look like they're melting around you or merging into one another. Um, there can be some strong emotional swings. Sort of a feeling of timelessness, like you're kind of going beyond conventional reality and conventional time. And sometimes an illusion that your mind and body are separating and no longer uh, bound to each other. So, um, LSD uh, affects certain brain receptors, technically serotonin 2A receptors. Um, and in the 90s, it seemed there was a resurgence um, in uh, uh, abuse. And it started reversing back again in 1997. So, like a lot of other drugs, it seems to uh, come and go in, in popularity. So facts and fiction about LSD. Um, it doesn't appear to produce psychological or physical dependence in the way that, let's say, heroin would do. Um, and for most people, there's only a slight chance of it really evoking panic or psychosis, you know, a bad trip. Um, 
A big piece of that, though, of course, is if you are taking it in a group of supportive, you know, in a supportive environment, you're less likely to sort of uh, freak out. Um, you know, some people say they use it to become creative, but it turns out it doesn't necessarily appear to. What happens is uh, when you are tripping, you think you're being really creative, but if you actually record what you're thinking or saying and then watch it in a normal state of mind, it probably doesn't seem as creative as you thought it was early on. Some people say that it's helped them spiritually in the sense of opening up their minds to different possibilities, um, but to continue to need that, it seems to lose that effect. Um, interestingly, there was, um, I think it was uh, psilocybin, um, which may be the next uh, one we talk about. Psilocybin has been given to people in uh, uh, hospice settings. In other words, they knew they were going to die. They um, were given one dose of this hallucinogen, uh, mushrooms, I think, in this case. There's probably been multiple experiments. And for a huge number of these people, they lost their fear of death. Um, that the experience they had sort of opened their mind in the sense of being less caught up in a feeling that they're restricted to just their own bodies. And, and so taking it once seemed to expand their um, understanding of who they were. Um, but as far as a long-term strategy for developing creativity doesn't seem to uh, be the case. Um, it also looks like, according to the research, it doesn't necessarily damage chromosomes uh, in people's body, although there is a chance that if you're pregnant, um, it could cause some birth defects. Um, there's also not been any relationship proven between um, LSD abuse and being a violent kind of a person. Um, it is possible, though, to have flashbacks, and I've definitely had uh, clients that uh, hadn't taken it in years, but the effect of the, uh, that they had when they were tripping just kind of came back out, um, out of nowhere, sometimes unpredictably. So psilocybin, uh, of course, derived from mushrooms, um, also affecting serotonin. Um, Um, I, I mentioned one thing that happens there is uh, uh, this, it's been used for many years by shamans as a, a way to get in touch with a, a different world. Um, the effects uh, tend to be more strongly visual, um, less emotionally intense, uh, and more likely to produce sort of an euphoria, sort of a uh, feeling good kind of a feeling as compared to LSD. Um, and there's a few um, derivatives. Uh, one is ayahuasca, uh, which is a funny thing. A friend of mine went to South America and said that he participated in a shamanic ritual and took some of that. Um, and the idea was to uh, have some kind of vision of things that might be useful. So. That's made from uh, the bark of a vine. Uh, hallucinogens related to norepinephrine, uh, mescaline is one of those, uh, which uh, is derived from peyote cactuses, cacti, uh, the buttons. Um, it can be really rough to ingest from my understanding that it tastes really terrible. Uh, people tend to vomit profusely <laughs> Uh, have strong headaches and nausea and taking that. Um, so, you know, when this was used naturally by uh, natives, you know, because it tastes so horrible and makes you vomit, it limits the amount that you take. Uh, one of the modern problems is uh, instead of that milder form used as a spiritual experience, it gets extracted and really refined, and what happens is it becomes very powerful and uh, uh, can end up causing more damage um, in that way. Ecstasy is also uh, works on norepinephrine, M MDMA, obviously a popular uh, club drug. Um, and it does look like it's it has some health risks that uh, they've done more um, 
research on this. Uh, one is severe hyperthermia. Um, your body temperature goes up, so it causes damage uh, to the brain. And dehydration, of course. Um, depression, anxiety. And because what happens is you start breaking down the serotonin receptors. And so just like you take serotonin medications to improve your mood, when that starts breaking down, you start getting depression and anxiety. Uh, let's see. Um, there are certain ones that uh, affect the acetylcholine uh, receptors. Um, so what happens is it diminishes the effects of acetylcholine in the parasympathetic nervous system. So uh, there's a theory that it's been involved in sorcery and witchcraft, uh, you know, since the, the Middle Ages. Um, so there are certain mushrooms that can uh, affect this. Um, uh, Jimson weed or Datura uh, also produce some of these effects. So the acute effects are feeling of delirium, uh, confusion, loss of memory, uh, not remembering what was going on in that state. Uh, so they've been called hexing drugs. So um, sometimes there's a combination of atropine and scopamoline and uh, ioskymine. Um, the nightshade um, is another one, mandrake roots and bane seeds. Um, by the way, tomatoes are actually um, derived from the nightshade family, so that's why you never want to eat a uh, tomato leaf. It's actually very poisonous. Uh, the, in the miscellaneous hallucinogens, um, uh, PCP, phenylcyclidine. Um, originally a street drug in the 1960s, um, it developed quite a reputation for producing uh, adverse effects, um, angel dust, uh, delirium, disorientation, hallucinations, intense anxiety, agitation, um, and the hallucinations are generally not as benign as they are with other uh, hallucinogens, they're much more intense. Big change in one's body image and a feeling of not being really you, depersonalization. Um, so it appears that it's blocking a specific subtype of glutamate receptors. Uh, let's see, it reappeared in the early 70s in a smokable form, and sometimes uh, marijuana will be sprinkled with some PCP. Um, so this one can result in some pretty aggressive tendencies, and sometimes people on PCP start to look like they have schizophrenia, just the hallucinations and visions and voices. Uh, so the book lists uh, some of the, uh, the names, uh, angel dust, etc. Uh, ketamine is another one, uh, chemically similar to PCP, uh, and it produces a mix of being both a stimulant as well as depressive or relaxing. Um, so it produces sort of a dreamlike intoxication, um, and it can also have a feeling of not being able to really move, um, feeling disoriented. Uh, it's been considered a club drug, um, but again, it can it can uh, depress respiration, so people can die from uh, not being able to breathe. Um, it's also been uh, factor in some date rape cases. Um, interestingly, by the way, the VA medical system is now experimenting with ketamine as a treatment uh, for combat veterans. So uh, the last I saw it was still pretty mixed uh, in terms of actual results. Um, and the last one, salvia, salvia divinorum. Uh, it's a Mexican leafy herb. Uh, and has pretty short duration hallucinogenic effects. Uh, it can be smoked or chewed or, or brewed as a tea. Um, also can produce laughter and out-of-body kind of experiences. Um, the DEA is considering whether or not to make it a Schedule One drug. Um, this is 
2013. I haven't looked up the uh, legality of this drug right now, um, but it may be illegal now. But it, it certainly, when this was written, it wasn't technically classified as illegal. So that's the uh, summary. So feel free to continue the discussion online through the forum if you have any more specific points or questions. And of course, read the chapters to get all the, all the detail. I just wanted to make sure I gave an overview.